GT Holidays, South India's number one travel brand. Govi, a vernacular edutech brand, skilling everyone everywhere. Hello and welcome to Galata Plus. In this video review episode, we're going to be talking about Imtiaz Ali's Amar Singh Chamkila. This is a beautifully made biopic that showcases a man as well as morality. In Amar Singh Chamkila, Imtiaz Ali gives us two films for the price of one. The first and more obvious narrative follows the shape of a biopic, the life and times of who's called the Elvis of Punjab, played by Dilji Dosanjh. That name, as we come to see, isn't just about the massive popularity that Chamkela enjoyed in his lifetime. This is the 1980s and he outsells Amitabh Bachchan in a live show. Just like Elvis was accused of corrupting young America with dance moves resembling those of a male striptease artist and songs whose erotic energy was even wilder, Chamkila was frequently hauled up by cultural gatekeepers for its sexually charged lyrics. Irshad Kamil, who outdoes himself in the soundtrack, writes these words for Chamkila's detractors. Ganda sa banda hai, social darinda hai. The rise and fall of a musician who brought joy to the masses and the question whether art ought to be censored for those very masses. These two layers come together magnificently in this movie. The film opens with much excitement as Punjab's most famous ambassador car is sighted by a wedding party. They have commissioned a music performance by Chamkila and his wife Amar Jodh, played by Parniti Chopra. And from then on, Imtiaz, who co-wrote the screenplay with Sajid Ali and his brilliant editor Arti Bajaj, do their trademark thing. We get small, sometimes micro scenes that get to the heart of the emotion in a heartbeat. And these small scenes come together like pieces in a colorful quilt. The film uses the assassination of Chamkila and Amar Jodh as a pivot point and keeps going back and forth in time. There appear to be many suspects. There are the fundamentalists, there are the militants who rose in influence after Indira Gandhi was shot dead. There were the rival singers. There were the loyalists that Chamkila abandoned along the way. But this is not a lazy who done it murder mystery. The real question is, who was this man? This decision to talk about Chamkila after his killing gives the sense of the man still being alive after death, as though people could not stop talking about him. It's like he's very much in the present even after he has become a part of the past. Put simply, it's the idea of immortality. And the writing and the editing juxtaposes faces and events with such nimbleness that we are never in doubt about who is, even though we, at least those of us unfamiliar with Chamkila, are faced with a host of unknown names and faces. I'll give you one example. Early on, we see a singer named Jinda in broad daylight on stage with Chamkila. He's on stage with Chamkila. Cut to we get a profile shot of Jinda at night as he adds his two bits about who Chamkila was from his point of view. The film thus isn't a definitive portrait, rather like a folk story passed on through the oral tradition, it is a collection of these orally narrated points of view that give us different facets and dimensions of a beloved but controversial man. At times, Chamkila himself becomes a narrator of his life. There is a great bit where he sits down to eat and appears displeased that the roti is cold. You think the scene is about one emotion but it quickly turns into another and we get the feeling that perhaps it is not fully possible to know this man. In another brilliant scene, Chamkila's father shouts at him for cutting his hair and disrespecting Sikhism but Chamkila calmly hands over a bundle of money and the old man quiets down immediately. As always, money solves all problems but what were Chamkila's own feelings about his religion? That we may never get to know. What has survived, what we know for sure is the music and A.R. Rahman hits it out of the park. The soundtrack album is superb, as is the background score. Imtiaz and Rahman fill the narrative with silences so that we really feel and register the emotion when the instruments make themselves heard behind the action. Like when an acoustic guitar is heard during a conversation outside a police station or when a sitar is heard as Chamkila talks to Amar Jyot alone for the first time or when a flute and strings are heard when Chamkila confronts another woman in his life or when a dramatic whiplash is heard when militants enter Chamkila's home. In a sense, Rahman's score grows over the course of the film. The first time we see the assassination, it's in total silence. When the same scenario is replayed towards the end of the film, we get a big orchestral score. The first time, the man is a stranger. The second time, we have come to know him to the extent that we can. So the emotion produced by the big score is truly 
earned. This is the rare movie that does not use its background score as a blunt instrument to pound the audience into emotional submission. There are scenes where we crave to know more about the emotional logic. Why did Chamkela leave the first woman in his life before marrying Amarjo? Why did Chamkela abandon his loyal manager before going to perform in Canada? This unknowability is emphasized with a series of distancing devices. For one, there are the photographs of the real-life Chamkela and Amarjo. Now, most biopics seek to maintain the illusion that the actors playing the subjects of the story are really the real people. And maybe at the end of the film, over the closing credits, we may get reminders of those real people, you know, those real life photographs. But Imtiaz destroys this notion by constantly going back to pictures of the real Chamkila, the real Amarjot, even as Diljit and Pariniti are playing Chamkila and Amarjot on screen. Amar Singh Chamkila keeps playing with form whenever we listen to performance we hear the songs in Diljit's and Pariniti's own voices, so there is no dissonance between the voices they speak in and the voices that they sing in. But when an inner emotion is underlined, when it has to be expressed, as opposed to those external performances, we get Rahman's score, we get Rahman's songs with playback singers like Mohit Chauhan, with Arijit Singh, with Alka Yagnik and Junita Gandhi. The original Punjabi lyrics are maintained in the live shows, but for those of us who don't know the language, we get Hindi equivalents of some lines. But these Hindi words are written in English. If you're watching the film with subtitles, there is an additional layer of distancing because now you are reading the English equivalents of those lyrics. Apart from the music, we get split screens designed like two squares on a film strip. We get animation and when we see love bloom from Amar Jyot's point of view from her side, we get flares on the borders of the frames like those old films where the edges of the camera were blurred out with Vaseline. Sylvester Fonseca is the cinematographer and this is one of the rare instances we see something flashy. Otherwise, he leads us through the story with the practiced casualness of turning the pages of a book. A lot of Amar Singh Chamkila is a familiar story, but the individual scenes and the actors are so good that they reinvent the broad beats, like in the bit where Chamkila and his manager hear a record playing his song somewhere and they run in search of it. They find the store where the record is being played and Diljit fingers his moustache. He does that little tweak with a small smile. He's proud, but the gesture, the smallness of the gesture makes it a muted kind of pride. When he makes a reference to his Dalit roots, Chamar Humpar Bhuka Nahi Marunga, his anger is muted. Even his business sense is muted. When he meets Amar Jodh, he says he does not need to hear her sing because someone he trusts has vouched for her. The innocence and naivete in Diljit's utterly captivating performance that goes a long way in making Chamkela someone you root for all the way and Pariniti too nicely underplays her part. On stage she keeps looking down as though she does not want to see audiences looking at her while she's singing those songs. So why did these two people sing those songs, sing such songs? One plausible reason is that Chamkela had no pretenses and filters and he simply wrote the way people spoke or simply said the things most people thought in private but would not say or express in public. After all, look at how the DSP speaks to his fawning subordinate. Itna bhi makhan na lagao ki andar haath gus jaye. Look at how women in the song Naram Kalja objectify a man's organ. Choti si aari leke tu kya katega jungle. You know, makes you laugh, right? Look at the lewd lines sung at weddings even when Chamkila tries to change his image and make a devotional album. By the way, that too became a blockbuster. Now, even when he's doing this, the masters want him to sing the songs that made him a star because they need to laugh amidst their troubles. And for them, this is a valid form of entertainment. And this is what Chamkila says to a posh jeans wearing reporter who says that he objectifies women in his songs. He does not deny that he does, but he also says, Chote log yehi pasand karte hain. And by chote log, he means those who are not privileged. He means the masses. The privileged people and the prudes and the conservatives, they complain, especially after Indira Gandhi's death. They say that people are dying and here is this man singing songs that go, Jija ji meri kamar ka naap le lo. Is it appropriate? But it is at these dark times that people need entertainment and 
who is to tell them what the appropriate form of entertainment is. Some of the older members of the audience may remember the cultural tug of war that erupted when Choli Ke Piche Kya Hai became a blockbuster and when Govinda and Karishma Kapoor nearly dislodged their pelvises gyrating to Sarkai Lok Khatiya Jada Lage. But both films, Khalnaik and Raj Babu, were blockbusters. In other words, the Chote Log, the masses lapped them up. It is the same conflict that was explored in Milos Forman's The People vs. Land. Harry Flint based on the man who published the pornographic magazine Hustler. If there is such a thing as freedom of expression, then should there be cultural gatekeepers or should people be left to self-censor what they want and don't want to read or see or hear? Imtiaz does not attempt to answer this question directly, which is how it should be. This question has no definite answer. It is how each one of us, how each individual responds to the issue. So Imtiaz just puts up both sides and leaves it for us to decide. Chamkela says, why am I being targeted when other singers sing such songs too? Could it be jealousy? Or is it that the most popular one becomes the most sought after when you want to set an example and do good for society. But indirectly at least, Imtiaz lets us see where his sympathies lie. He is all for Chamkila and all against cultural censorship. The film gives us logical explanations. For example, that Chamkila's caste mentality never really went away, that he remained a slave of the audience all his life, giving them what they wanted. Another logical explanation we are given is that he has risen from rags to riches and he cannot return to where he came from. Chamkila tells Amar Jot that let's make money first, then aram se sochenge kya sahi hai aur kya galat. But emotionally speaking, Chamkila comes off like a martyr for a cause because of the grand eulogy Rahman gifts him. And that's the song Vida Karo. The beautifully penned words mask the sarcasm that drips through the song. It says, let me go because a dirty man like me does not deserve to be in your world of pure people. Tum sabhi saaf sahi hum at mela mein. The moving song breaks your heart and makes you wonder what art is and who gets to decide how it is practiced or how people choose to entertain themselves. In this age of social media and rampant armchair activism, Amar Singh Chamkila raises important questions and yes, it is also a beautiful film. And that's it about Amar Singh Chimkila. If you like this video review, do subscribe to Galata Plus and see you soon at the movies. GT Holidays, South India's number one travel brand. Govi, a vernacular edutech brand, skilling everyone everywhere.